I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness, right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. <laughs> Little Miss Honey, how are you today? Oh, I know the most... Oh, excuse me. Hi. Oh, I'm just fine. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. That's fine, too. Thank you. You're welcome. I know the most wonderful thing. What is it? Well, maybe it isn't wonderful, but it is interesting. Well, 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 what is it? Hummingbirds are the only birds that can fly backwards. Well, that is very wonderful. How did you happen to think about that? I was just humming, and it came into my mind. Well, I think that's a very wonderful thing. A when hummingbirds are the only birds that can do it. Yes. Oh, I wish there was something that I could do, that I was the only one that could do it. There is. What's that? No one can read the funnies the way you do. Well, thank you. Now, will you please read them? I should say I will. Puck the Comic Weekly. Yes. Very well, I'll read that in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page, hop along, Cassidy. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Six guns blazing as he thunders along. Give us music for hop along. Hoppy has been on the trail of a crook called the Chameleon, who always changes his disguise when committing one of his crimes. A girl named Chiquita has led Hoppy to an old Aztec temple, telling him that he'll find the Chameleon there. Then she runs away. Hoppy moves cautiously toward it. Last picture top row, high above at the top of the temple, a silent watcher rises from the darkness and brings a rifle to bear on the figure below. <coughs> Hoppy falls to the ground, first picture, second row. Eagerly, the sniper descends from the temple ruins to learn the results of his marksmanship. He sees Hoppy lying motionless at the bottom. A smile of triumph comes on his face. He moves closer to Hoppy and bends over him. Suddenly, Hoppy springs into action, drives one blow to the man's midrib, <coughs> pulls him over, and then knocks him out. Quickly, Hoppy frisks him. Last picture, second row. He finds a strange coin in one of the pockets. Hoppy exclaims, Why, he's carrying an Aztec coin, just like the one given me by the Texas Rangers. I only knew what it's for. And then Hoppy begins a search of the old ruins. After searching the ruins for some time, first picture bottom row, something in the wall catches his eye. He exclaims, Why, that's odd. A square metal rod protruding from the rock. And then he remembers the Aztec coin he took from the man he had just knocked out had an open square in the center. Hoppy tries the square in the coin against the metal rod. The coin seems to fit it like a key. Curiously, Hoppy turns the coin in a clockwise motion. Suddenly, a section of the wall begins to move slowly. It swings inward. And Hoppy sees before him a secret entrance to the interior of the temple. Slowly, he walks in. He finds himself in a giant room and sees several men pointing guns at him. And in the center of the room, last picture, a man whom Hoppy recognizes. He exclaims, Simon Grief, hey, what are you doing here? Simon Grief, the man who had been arousing the citizens of Buckskin to catch the chameleon, says, Surprise, Mr. Cassidy. You see, I happen to be the chameleon. The chameleon? Oh, and Hoppy is alone against those men. And inside that temple, and no one knows the secret entrance. If they shoot him, then no one would know. Oh, I wish those Texas Rangers would come. Well, let's hope they may be here next week. Now? Oh, now, let's turn over the page and see if Prince Diane is there again today. Very well, over the page we go to page three. See, I'm right. Oh, you're always right, you bright thing, you. Thank you. I'm anxious to read that because Val and Arthur started back home again from their hunting trip, and they've had so many accidents. Yes, you bet they have. They really had tough luck. Their canoe was swept into swift rapids and has been badly damaged. Yes, and after all the trouble they went through to build it. Well, I wonder if they'll get started home today. Well, let's read and find out right now. Here we go with Prince Valiant and the Days of King Arthur. Hecket, Breckett, Grey Mulkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince.
After repairing their canoe, Val and Arf are once again on their way home. They've rigged up a little sail this time, and driven by the wind, float along a lake, big picture top road. There's neither clock nor calendar to worry them with the urgency of time. So they traverse river and lake in a leisurely manner, alert for danger, but ready to enjoy each passing day. But almost at this moment, the guide who had escaped from the accident in the river arrives at the castle. He's taken before King Aguar, Val's father, and Alita, Val's wife. And he tells them the story of the accident and finishes by telling them that Val is dead. His words are as a cloth that wipes the color from Alita's cheek, and the king's face becomes a white mask. When he is finished, Alita smiles and bids a servant see that he is fed and cared for. And then she turns to Val's father, first picture bottom row, and sees the sorrow written on his face, and she says, Have faith, sire. Did not your son survive the siege of Andalkrag and steal me from two score warrior suitors? Did he not stand alone before the gates of Samarand and vow to conquer it? And did. And did he not follow me to strange lands across unknown seas and bring me home? Have faith. And then she goes to her room. She sees little Prince Arn sitting quietly as if his heart would break. And she comforts him by telling him that nothing could happen to his father. And then she goes through the day, cheering others, assuring them that nothing could happen to Belle. But that night, in the quietness of her own room, although she has given courage to others, she has little left for herself. And worry for the man she loves drives the courage from her heart. And her tears wet the pillow as she weeps with fear that she might never see her Val again. Oh, isn't that too bad? I'm glad the guard was safe and got home, but it's too bad he got home before Val did because now everyone will believe that Val is dead and they'll all be so sad. Yes, that is too bad. And there's Val and Arf floating along, taking it easy in their canoe. Oh, I think I'm angry at them. I wish they'd hurry home so the other people won't be so sad. Well, maybe he will. Maybe with that sail in his canoe, he'll be home sooner than we think. Now, how would you like to read Donald Duck? Oh, that's one question you never need to ask me. You know I'd always want to read Donald Duck. <laughs> All right, then. Let's go over the page past Perry Mason and the Lone Ranger. Turn over another page. Ah, there's Donald Duckle. Yes, sir, Donald Duckle. Good for a chuckle. Say the magic words with me. Squeeze them, squeeze them, squeeze them, squeeze them, Let's have music. You better quack, quack. Donald's girlfriend, Daisy, is visiting him. She finds Donald stretched out in a chair, all worn out, hardly able to hold his head up. And Daisy exclaims, Heavens, what's wrong? Donald replies, Nothing. Just tired, I guess. But you need pep vitamins. I'll have some sent out. Donald replies, Ugh, oh, um, okay, okay. <laughs> A short time later, Daisy sends over a can of pep vitamins. Donald opens the can, takes out a handful of vitamins, and drops them down his gullet. And then washes them down with a glass of water. Two hours later, he takes another dose. Two hours later, another. And another. And another. Next morning, fourth picture, top row, he wakes up. Opens his eyes, leaps out of bed, and calls Daisy. Oh, uh, hello, Daisy. Wow. I'm a new man. Pep me the coat. Thanks a million. That's well. I'll drop in to see you this afternoon. After a hearty breakfast, Donald is busy vacuuming the rug. I, I should have vacuumed this joint two weeks ago. First picture next row, he's washing windows. Nothing I hate worse than dirty windows. Next, he scrubs the kitchen floor. Then he cleans out the basement. Then he cleans out the attic. Short time later, Daisy comes up the walk. She says to herself, My, I bet he'd be like a new man. She opens the door and walks in and stops surprised. For there is Donald, last picture, lying in a chair, hardly able to hold up his head. 
He says wearily, Guess I overdid it a bit, Cook. I'm in Boston. <laughs> He thinks he can do everything at once. Yes. If he was sensible, he'd do a little bit each day. Then he wouldn't be worn out to smile at Daisy. Of course. Anybody knows that. Anybody except Donald. Oh, he's so cute. I love him. So do I. Well, now, how would you like to read Dick's Adventures? Oh, I'd love to read Dick's Adventures. Let's see if I can guess where he is. The last page of the first section? You are right. <laughs> Dick's Adventures is on the last page of the first section. So today, Dick is starting a new adventure, so please, quick read. So, all right, here we go with Dick's Adventures in Dreamland. So say the magic words with me. Rickety pack is that is Let's have music, music for adventurous, for adventurous Dick. Dick and his dad have been talking about the early days of American history and about the Indian chief, Tecumseh. Dick, who was in bed, half-dozing, murmurs, In Annapolis, the midshipmen have a statue of old chief Tecumseh. Who was he? What did he do, Dad? Gee, I wish I... wish I do. And back, back, back he goes in his dreams. He finds himself, in his dream, in a covered wagon, dressed in the clothes of an early settler. His dad is driving a team of horses. Dick is saying, Gosh, Dad, now I remember. Tecumseh was a terrific character. He ruled over a big Indian settlement in Indiana on the banks of the Wabash near Tippecanoe River. It was around 1810. Hey, Jeepers, what are we doing in this covered wagon? Last picture, top row, his dad shows surprise. Why, we're lighting out for a new Northwest Territory, Dick. Maybe on the Wabash. Lots of settlers are heading out from the east. They'll be needing a good blacksmith and a gunsmith like you and me, Dick. Proceeding a few miles farther, Dick and his dad are halted by a soldier who tells them first picture, second row. Bit of engine trouble ahead, folks. Keep your guns handy. Finally, they arrive at a settlement on the edge of the Wabash River. There they see a crowd of people. And last picture, second row, on a landing near the water's edge. A loud quarrel between two men is taking place. It's Governor William Henry Harrison and the Indian Chief Tecumseh. And Tecumseh is saying, last picture, Our white father speaks of fair treatment to his red children, yet he claims our land more and more and more. We are no longer children. We are now men. We think ourselves capable of defending our country. Listen to my warning. No white man shall cross this river. There's going to be trouble. That Indian looks really angry. And Governor Harrison doesn't look as though he's very afraid. And if the white people cross the river, then the Indians are going to attack them. Is that what he's saying? That's exactly what he means. I wonder what will happen. I wonder if the white men will cross. Well, we'll find that out next week. Now look underneath Dick's adventures. Oh, Rusty Riley. I'm anxious to read that. And I'll read it in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly, and on the last page of the first section, Rusty Riley. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. <laughs> Rusty and Pete have been locked up as prisoners in the old caverns by two crooks who have robbed the Milestone Farm. The crooks have gone back to get their loot where they had hidden it in an old abandoned house. Meanwhile, Tex has stopped in at headquarters to ask the detectives if they have any news of Rusty and Pete. While he's there, the detective has given a notice about a couple of crooks that are wanted by the FBI. <coughs> Tex is curious about it. The detective explains to him, saying, uh, No, this is just a flyer sent out by the FBI, Tex. The, the kind you see in post offices. About a couple of swindlers known as Limey Joe and the Duke. Here, take a look. Hmm. Uh, would it be possible to lend me this notice for, uh, say, an hour, maybe? Why, sure, Tex, you may keep it. They always send a couple of spares. And why? Oh, just a hunch. I might meet up with them sometime. A little later at the farm, Tex is carefully looking at the notice. He says thoughtfully, I ain't exactly what you'd call an artist, but uh, I think I can do a little retouching on these here faces. <laughs> 
Meanwhile, last picture top row, in the caverns, Rusty and Pete have rigged up a light for the battery of the car. They turn it on, and it lights up the caverns. Rusty says, Hey, this was a neat idea of yours to take the battery out of your car and hook it up to one of the headlights, Pete. Yeah, it'll give us plenty of light as long as it lasts. It's a new battery, so it ought to give us a few hours steady use, Rusty. Okay, let's get going. First picture, bottom row. The boys are still searching the caverns, trying to find a way out. But so far, they've had no luck. Pete says, Hey, gosh, Rusty, we've come a heck of a long way looking for another way out. I, I begin to think we should have stayed put till Sir Percival sent somebody to let us out. Hey, listen, Pete, if those crooks find those troopers where we hit them, well, we'll never hear from them again. And if they don't, and they come back here, you can bet it won't be to let us go. Hey, hey, Rusty, Rusty, I think we've used up about half the charge in this battery. We better turn back or we'll be caught in the dark. Okay, Pete. I hate to give up, but I guess you're right. The boys turn around to start back. And then they see two tunnels. Rusty exclaims, hey, Gee, Willikins, Pete, which one of those tunnels do we come through? Why, we... Well, I, I think... Gosh, Rusty, I don't know. At this moment, last picture in Mr. Miles' study, Tex is handing him a notice that he has gotten from the detective. Tex is saying, Hey, uh, boss, uh, just take a look at that FBI flyer. I've been doing a little retouching with a lead pencil. Don't they look kind of familiar? Mr. Miles looks at it and exclaims, By George Tex... Is it possible? Sir Percival and his man, Nobbs. Oh, goody, goody, goody. Tex was smart. He knew that Limey Joe and the Duke were those two Englishmen who stayed at the Marston Farm. Yes, you bet he did. He drew the mustache on the Duke's face, and that told him the whole story. Well, I hope they hurry to the detectives and that they can catch the crooks and make them tell where the boys are. Yes, because if he doesn't, the boys are apt to get lost in those caverns. And it might take a long, long time to find them. Yes. Well, we'll find out more about that next week. Now it's time for Dagwood and Blondie. And here they are on the first page of the second section. And we'll read that right away. Here we go with Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> Ram a food, am a fum, zim zam zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> Dagwood's enjoying his paper at home, when suddenly his daughter rushes in and shrieks, Daddy, quick, a dog catcher just picked up Daisy. Dagwood leaps to his feet and flies out of the house like a man shot out of a cannon. He tackles the dog catcher. Stop, stop! That's unconstitutional! You can't do that to a taxpayer! Last picture, top row, the dog catcher sits up and says, Well, if she's a taxpayer, where's the tag on her collar? Well, she has one. It must have fallen off around her house. And Dagwood starts for the house to look for the dog tag. The dog catcher puts Daisy in the truck, first picture, second row, saying, I'll wait here till you get back. Dagwood calls, uh, be, be, be calm, Daisy. I'll find your dog tag and I'll be right back. <laughs> and into the house he goes, searching for Daisy's dog tag. He looks under the chairs, under the table, under the sofa cushions, and Blondie sobs. Oh, our darling Daisy being carried off in a wagon like a common crook. Now, Blondie, I'll get her a lawyer. Come on, help me find her license tag. And the hunting continues. Upstairs, downstairs, side stairs, kitchen, dining room, living room, back porch, front porch, basement. I found it, Dagwood. It came off while she was getting her bath. First picture, third row, Dagwood dashes out of the house yelling, We found it, Daisy! You're a citizen in good standing again! And he stops in front of the truck full of dogs. But no dog catcher. Dagwood asks the passing man, Hey, hey, where's the dog catcher? Oh, uh, he went in that restaurant there for his lunch. Dagwood turns to the truck, last picture of the row, opens the door saying, oh, We can't wait for him. Come on, Daisy, I'll take you right home. And he leans into the truck, trying to get hold of Daisy, who is buried under a lot of other dogs. Suddenly, he slips in. And the door snaps shut and locks behind him. And first picture bottom row, Dagwood is in the dog truck with all the dogs. And he says, oh, there's a snap lock on the outside. We can't get out. And the dog catcher who comes out of the restaurant sees Dagwood in the truck with all the dogs. And the dogs and the man laugh and laugh and laugh. Short time later, the phone rings at the Bumstead house. Cookie answers it. Hello? Yes? Yeah. Uh, just a minute, please. And then she turns to Blondie and says... It's a city dog pound, Mama. They want you to come right down there and claim your husband. Blondie goes. Oh, 
Oh, Last right. picture, Blondie is down at the dog pound. She stops in front of the cage in which there are 42 dogs looking very unhappy and a man who looks very much like a lion. He also looks very much like Dagwood. And the dogs go... And Dagwood goes... And Blondie turns to the keeper and barks... Since when do husbands need dog licenses? <laughs> Isn't that funny the way Dagwood fell in the dog catcher's truck and got locked up? Yes. And he looks mighty unhappy in that cage down at the dog pound, too. <laughs> oh, that Dagwood, he's so funny, I just love him. I love funny people, too. But now look at the bottom of the page. Roy Rogers. Oh, yes, and there has been a lot of trouble down at the logging camp. And last week, he discovered something very important. Yes, Roy discovered that somebody has been changing the brands on logs belonging to Pauline Bunyan. Isn't that queer, putting brands on logs just like they do with cattle out west? Well, you know why that is? That's because all of the logging camps send their logs down to the mill by way of the river. And the logs are all have to get mixed up in the river, you oh, see. Oh, I see. And then when the logs go to the mill and they take them out of the river, then they can tell whose logs they are by the brand on the logs. How did you ever guess that? I just figured it out. Oh, but you're smart. Yes, I am, am I? Mm-hmm. Well, now let's see whether Roy finds out that Etch Need is the man who's been changing the brand and stealing Pauline's logs. Here we go with Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. A yip by yo. Now here we go with Roy and Trigger. A yip by yo. <laughs> Things are beginning to move quickly. Roy discovers piles and piles of logs, all with diamond brands stamped over Pauline's triangle mark. Pauline remembers that the diamond symbol was used by a camp that is some distance behind hers some time ago. Pauline's niece, Wildwood, suggests they should try to find old Cosmo, that he might know something about the log thieves. So last picture, top row, as they ride up to the foreman's shed, a man there calls, Hey, Pauline, spring fresh has started. The river's rising. Pauline tells Wildwood to tell the foreman to round up a new crew of rivermen for the big drive. Roy says, Hey, log handle's out of my line, Miss Bunyan. I'm going after old Cosmo. First picture bottom row, Roy has picked up old Cosmo's trail. Huh. Old Cosmo's burrow trail leads south, Trigger. Maybe the abandoned logging camp Pauline mentioned is a log pirate's headquarters. Meanwhile, old Cosmo had caught Etch Sneed in the act of changing the brand on Pauline's logs. Etch had told him he would never live to tell anybody about it. And now Etch and his men are carrying Cosmo to the top of a hill to throw him over a cliff. One of the men says, Yeah, when he found out about our log pirate and he wrote his death warrant, eh, Etch? And Etch growls, Yeah. Yeah, it's tough work tooting Cosmo up here. By tossing him over, it'll look like an accident. (laughs) At that moment, last picture, Roy at the foot of the cliff approaches. Suddenly, he sees a body fall to the ground before his eyes. Hey, what? That's old Cosmo. Oh, isn't it terrible of those men to have thrown old Cosmo over the cliff? Yes, and now that old Cosmo's dead, there's no one to testify that Etch Need is the crook. Well, if Roy hurries, maybe he'll see who threw Cosmo over the cliff, and then he'll be smart enough to know that they're the ones who've been changing the log brand. We'll find that out next week. Now, let's go over the page. Oh, look, Flash Gordon. Yes, Flash Gordon. And a strange thing has happened to the Earth. It's covered completely with ice and snow because the sun isn't shining on it. And Flash suspected that someone who wants to conquer the Earth has shut the sun's rays away from the Earth to make it cold. And so Flash has gone on an expedition to investigate. And Flash has discovered that the people responsible for this are giants from another planet. And Flash hid on a jet sled of one of the giants, and when the giant returned to his headquarters on the moon Rhea, Flash had come along too. And now Flash is all alone among these giants, and that's terribly dangerous because if they see him, he will never escape. Well, let's read now and find out what happens next with Flash Gordon. rega dega doon doon saskimatash Let's have music for Heroic Flash. <laughs> Inside an Arctic glacier, the invaders from Saturn's moon Rhea are using their secret science to freeze the Earth into a gigantic snowball on which only Saturnians can survive. Nothing stands between them and success but Flash Gordon, alone in the enemy stronghold. Moving cautiously down an icy corridor, Flash leaps for cover and holds his breath as a busy Saturnian nearly runs into him. Last picture top row at the end of the corridor... Flash comes upon a vast cavern that houses the Saturnian's ionic ray generator. 
he discovers that they're using the Earth's magnetic field and the northern lights to blanket our planet with an electronic screen, shutting off the sun's heat rays. But sudden disaster overtakes Flash One's man raid when a Saturnian engineer spots the Earthman and shouts an alarm. Order out work! Clamor brings a swarm of weirdly armed giants rushing into the cavern. Flash realizes he's hopelessly outnumbered, so instead of firing futilely at the attacking horde, he empties his neutron beam gun into the ionic ray power plant. And last picture. With an earth-shaking roar, the generators explode upward, shattering the glacier into a million fragments and scattering the Saturnian machines over the Arctic ice. Although partly shielded, Flash is stunned and hurled skyward. It's blowing the bliss apart. Not only that, if that's the machines that's controlling the sun's rays, it means that now it has been destroyed. Oh, my, that's terrible. I wonder what'll happen to Flash. Do you think he will be killed in that explosion? Well, we'll find out all these things next week in the adventures of Flash Gordon. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I've got to go now. All right, Mr. Comic Weekly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date, and a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man... The Jolly Comic Weekly Man.